going to the nightclub known as that nerd show and the Saturday Saturday morning nerd show. Just kidding. We, we thought it would be kind of cool to give you a little nightclub music. Uh, <laughs> for those of you that are still drunk out there thinking that you're still in a nightclub, this is a test. You're not. But anyway, welcome to our Saturday morning nerd show. Uh, we've been off a couple of weeks, so we got kind of a big show that we're going to be talking about. Uh, I am Marcus Blake, your host. Join with me as the brewing sailor, Mr. Brendan Smith. Hey, Chad, just to confirm, this was only iced tea, but after listening to that song, I was kind of wishing it was whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want a jello shot to go with that whiskey? <laughs> uh, I'll stop, I'll stop want, the Henny. <laughs> and I want to reassure of... the viewers that there was only coffee in this mug. Anyway. Mm. This is water, um, but I got a bottle of gin on the counter. I can always shit. <laughs> And also joining us uh, with us is Mr. Chad Womack from the Electric Jellyfish Podcast. Morning, morning gents. Yeah, I, I don't need morning coffee. That fried my brain already. <laughs> I've got Hennessy aftertaste in my mouth now. All right. So before we get started with our show, um, I know we're a week late. It's technically not the 4th of July, but we did want to talk about the best movies to watch on the 4th of July. And also the best and the worst summer blockbuster movies that have come out in July, especially the 4th of July weekend over the last 40 years or 45 years since we really started, uh, you know, well, since we coined the phrase summer blockbusters uh, since the mid 70s. So um, obviously, uh, if you're watching this show, you already know that we're not talking about Star Wars because that did not come out around the 4th of July. And if you don't know that, then I question if you're a true Star Wars fan to begin with. But anyway. Uh, all right. Some other things quickly to announce. Yes, the Black Widow movie is out. Uh, you can get it on Disney uh, Premier Access for 30 bucks. Uh, it's in the theaters. It's the first uh, Marvel movie that we've been able to see in the theaters. Or, well, actually Disney movie, I should say. Wasn't really any Marvel movies last year. This movie got pushed back to this year because of the pandemic. Um, quickly, full review will be up online. Uh, Chad, you watched it last night, and I watched it last night. Uh, Brendan, you still haven't seen it, right? No, I, I, you know, I wanted to actually go see this in the theater, but, and I probably still will just because I haven't seen a movie in the theater for almost two years. Right. But at the same time, what? I'm just really apathetic towards it, but we'll get was, into that. Was the last movie you saw in the theater, The Rise of Skywalker? God, did you have to remind me? Ouch. Anyway, <laughs> uh, hey, at least you didn't have to pay for the ticket. But anyway. Thank you, Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again for that, brother. Right. Appreciate uh, you taking uh, that uh, bullet for the team. One no of our many write-offs here at that nerd show. Um, anyway, uh, the only thing I want to say about Black Widow is uh, I think it's a great swan song to that character, you know, giving us a little bit more background about where she came from and why and uh, stuff like that. I'm not saying it's the best of the Marvel movies. It obviously isn't. And as we were talking about earlier, it feels like this movie is about five years too late. Uh, but the way that it connects, you know, Captain America Civil War to the Infinity War movies, and we look back at, you know, her character, uh, you know, it, it, it's a fun movie, even though it also feels a lot like it's a born identity movie with all the action and stuff. But, um, all I will say is if you're looking for, even if it's a matinee and you just want to get back to the theater, I mean, it's worth seeing in the theater. Uh, I also think if you're a family of four or whatever and you just buy it on Disney uh, Plus, it's still worth, you know, the 30 bucks. Um, it's not the worst Marvel movie. It definitely isn't the best. That's how I look at it. Um, also, I do think we need more David Arbor as the Red Guardian. He, I, I, think, I think he made that movie. Um, so let's, let's, let's do that. We need, we need more David Arbor as the Red Guardian. I think we need the whole family, actually. I think we need Rachel Weiss, David Arbor, and who I think really stole this movie was Florence Pugh. She was probably yeah. my favorite, favorite actor in this, in this entire thing. 
Uh, Julie Jones, who uh, went and saw uh, the movie earlier this week and is doing our uh, review, her and I were talking, and that's that. She was kind of like indifferent to seeing that movie, um, but she walked away was like, I was pleasantly surprised by how much I did like it and how great Florence Pugh really was. So, mm -hmm. um, and obviously, if you watch the little you know post credits. Uh, scene, they are setting up her character for future Marvel staff, which I don't feel like that's really a spoiler as, you know, if you're introducing her character in this story and she doesn't die at the end of the Black Widow, you've pretty much established that, hmm, maybe she'll be seen again in the Marvel Universe. But but I, I agree with you, Chad. The, the, the whole family uh, was really good. Uh, I, I just thought everything about it, you know, was that part was uh, pretty good. So, um, but, you know, what do you say? It's kind of an origin story for Black Widow and where she came from and how she ended up at S.H.I.E.L.D. And, uh, you know, it's just something that we probably should have had years ago. Mm -hmm. Now it's, here's a Marvel movie about Black Widow. Um and we never got around to giving you, but you know, you haven't seen a Marvel movie in over a year, so here you go. Enjoy. Yeah, that, that yeah, to it, me, that's that's its biggest sin is that that's the emotional stakes that we're that we're riding on here. Not so much the fact that we don't know what happens to Nat because we all do, but right. the fact that we were just kind of hinging our summer movie going hopes on something to bring us back into the fold. And yeah. That's really where all the stakes are. Is is this movie going to be worth going out for? Uh, since and, we've been cooped up so long. And that's the thing. Like like we said earlier, this movie came out five years, six years too late. Like because normal, like we, we're looking at it from the point of view of people that freaking run a podcast and talk about this shit all the time. You know, <laughs> we are not your average normal day, everyday moviegoers. The average moviegoer out there, when they heard there was a Black Widow movie coming out, going, "Wait, didn't she die?" <laughs> You know, <laughs> so like the average moviegoer starts off confused. That's never a right. good way to start the movie. Well, right. And I mean, maybe uh, if it's a spy thriller, but not if it's a Marvel movie. I mean, and it, well, let's be honest. OK, it might feel like a born identity movie, but this ain't exactly Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy. OK, so, <laughs> you know, that that's just not a good way to start off the movie. So th there's a lot of apathy for the movie, um, myself included, which is sad because I actually really like the Black Widow character and always have. Um, and hey, Scarlett Johansson. Um, but, right. you know, I, I, I just, yeah, I just have, I'm apathetic. Like, it's just too late. Like, I know she's already died. Like, I think that the, my attitude towards this movie came out, per, was perfectly summed up in a meme two weeks before the movie came out. Somebody was like, hey, Black Widow drops in two weeks. And they're like, the next frame goes, nah, bro, they dropped her two years ago. She dropped. <laughs> and I, I was like, yeah, basically. So I don't know. We'll see. I'm, I'm still going to watch it because I'm probably going to go to, I, I might go to a, a matinee tomorrow just because I haven't been to a movie in, since Roger Skywalker. And uh, <laughs> fuck you, Jake. Well, what? Yeah. And the one thing we can say about Rise of Skywalker now is, well, it looked good on a big screen. <laughs> I'm not saying there was much else there, but it looked good on a big screen. <laughs> hey, I got a nice plate of spaghetti, but I got shit all over it. Like, I, <laughs> God, the, the scene that pissed me off so much is the space horses on the Star Destroyer. Just tilt. <laughs> they go by. Oh, we didn't. We didn't. We didn't explain those gravity boots. Yeah, <laughs> is that a thing that didn't say that? Or is, that or yeah. is the critical the critical drinker likes to call it a magic bullshit device? Uh, <laughs> well, anyway, otherwise uh, known as the as the the Sith dagger. But let's move on. <laughs> um, look, all I'm going to say about Black Widow is like I personally would give it a seven. It's an okay movie. It's not the best. It's not the worst. Uh, and I think it, it is a good one to go see in a theater. You're, you know, I mean, if you're going to, if you're looking for that great action movie with lots of high flying stunts and car chases and blah, 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 go see Black Widow instead of, you know, F9, because you've seen that story before. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> and for the love of God, can we stop the goddamn family memes? 
<laughs> Holy <laughs> balls. The only one that I saw was funny was Vin Diesel laying on the ground in France from uh, saving Private Ryan since I guess a sniper is stronger than family. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's my favorite one too right oh all right God. uh one quick announcement too after we're uh, done talking about this uh we're not going to talk about loki or anything uh until the series is done it is getting very good uh but uh you come to my house for that you, can, you right. come to electric you, podcast you can, for that we break it down now we're not doing a full assessment until it's all done however i'm okay with plenty of memes of alligator loki <laughs> I gotta have the eyes on. I gotta have the eyes on. At some point, I gotta have the eyes on. Right. Um, but we wanted to do a quick announcement for the gamers out there. Uh, we will have stuff up on the Ultimate Game League uh, YouTube channel uh, and websites um, here a little bit later uh, this weekend. But uh, we started. To, we were able to do some live streaming and show people. How the ultimate how ultimate gaming tournaments work uh, down at Craft and Growler, which we're going to be doing every other Wednesday. Uh, league will start back up on the 14th, uh, but we had a great time being able to live stream, play games, uh, you know, talk beer and stuff like that, and introduce you know people to you know the concept where they ended up having to play games that they weren't really familiar with and how challenging it can be and hats off to both of you for that by the way you for setting it up and brendan you for facilitating it good job boys all right well the one thing that brendan and i definitely learned is uh no matter what somehow some way when we play hockey it isn't going to end in three periods <laughs> we, <laughs> will go to, we will go to overtime <laughs> so but we had a blast uh, doing that as well uh and again, getting to talk more about craft beer and, you know, what works and stuff like that. And that you're going to be able to hear more from Smitty, uh, you know, especially with what he's brewing at Craft and Growler. I know that there's a lot of places that are trying to have places uh, to game. And that's and I think that's great. Now that we're getting past the pandemic, there needs to be more opportunities for people to go and do tournaments and stuff. Um, and, you know, we are trying to provide our own esports league with more challenges. But I will say this. It's not this week's Sound of the Apocalypse, although it could be. Uh, we're going to get to that in a minute. But when you're a dude that hosts, hey, I'm setting up some, you know, training in my garage on fighting games. And I'm probably, and, and I'm looking into getting some box fans. That doesn't really entice me to come hang out in your garage in July in Texas. Because you might have some box fans. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking to get yeah. box fans is not a is not a, a word of encouragement. It sounds like you I don't have, have them. Yet. I have two swamp chillers. Okay. Not. I'm looking for a box fan. Mm -hmm. Dude, they're not that yeah. hard to find. You go to Home Depot. Right. And even then, <laughs> splurge and get those portable air conditioners, uh, which are a little bit better. But if you don't want to deal with something like that in, in some home dude, some weird dude's garage, you can come down to Craft and Growler every other Wednesday and in between rounds in the tournament, you can do uh, fighting game challenges while drinking good craft beer in an air conditioned building. <laughs> it's my little, uh, it's my little spiel, like a used car salesman uh, about that. But no, it's true. I'm like, as hot as it is, I'm like, I'd rather be inside with good craft beer and fantastic tater tots, you know, trying to do this. So anyway, uh, we will keep our, our the, the schedule going and it'll be on that nerd show and the Ultimate Game League, ultimategameleague.com. Um, you can check out everything that we're doing uh, with the league and stuff like that. So also I want to give a shout out to the couple who, uh, just moved from Mississippi to Texas. Uh, we busted one of the gaming TVs on Wednesday, but I was quickly able to uh, replace it by this couple who didn't have room in their new apartment and 50 inch flat screen LED for $35. Thank you very much. Um, Facebook marketplace. You can find a lot of, uh, a lot of deals uh, and stuff. 
Uh, and you know what? I bet you can find some used box fans out there if you're trying to set up a gaming thing in your garage. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I shouldn't rag on it too much, but, you know, we're always competing with different things going on, and we are trying to build our ultimate, you know, game league up and trying to get more and more gamers out. So when I have to compete with, i got something in my garage, I'm like, that sounds a great way as for to get kidnapped. Gamer, to capture gamers. <laughs> but that's your that stereotype. Right. It's like I saw so, a reminder on my Facebook feed this morning. It was how to, uh, how to kept, uh, kidnap a 28 year old in 2016. And it said it was instead of free candy, it said rare Pokemon inside. <laughs> Gee. Uh, wow. So, all right. This week's on the apocalypse. Yeah. It does have to deal with the gaming world. Very rarely do gaming critics actually all agree. Um, I mean, everybody's pretty rigid in how they look at games uh, what they consider good and what they consider bad. But it was pretty much unanimous across the board that the new Dungeons & Dragons Dark Alliance uh, is hot garbage, is just an absolutely shitty-ass game, and not even worth downloading for free on Xbox Game Pass. Uh, now, we rated it pretty low. It, it ended up with a 3 out of 10, and that 3 was we gave 3 points to the logo. Because the logo looked cool, and you at least got that right. Um, the rest of it, not so much. And you can go and read our latest issue uh, from uh, the, our squad leader, K. Scott Cooper, about why uh, Vermintide 2, Warhammer Vermintide 2, is what you should actually be playing in an RPG game, and how Dark Alliance looked just like a 90s ripoff of something like that. But, I mean, from major outlets that cover games to YouTube reviewers and everything. It just, everybody has just agreed. That's a shit game and shouldn't have been released and a waste of money. So yeah, that's this week's out of the apocalypse. We all agree on a terrible game. Um, and it just feels weird to say that, but there's not even, I can't even find one person out there that's like, I'm going to be different than everybody else and just say it's really good. No. Nope. I, not, let's, out of curiosity, let's take a look. Dark <laughs> Alliance on Metacritic. Yeah. I'm curious. Yeah, I haven't but, uh, even seen that, but. Okay, Dark Alliance on Metacritic. Wow, it actually has a 54. I am shocked really? it's so high. The user score is a 34. Uh, okay. So I'm curious. Is that the bots working overtime to give it reviews? So it doesn't Oh, look my terrible? God. PC Gamer, you whore. They gave it an 82. Who would have oh, paid God. for that? Wow. Really? Yes. Also, this week's well, it's not really this week's out of the apocalypse. We've also we've always known that PC Gamer are a bunch of words out there and can be easily bought off with their reviews. Yeah, like even IGN gave it a three. Like I guess they didn't pay IGN enough. I guess they pay all their all their advertising budget went to PC Gamer. Um, uh, now I will say this: if you want us to talk good about this game, uh, we can easily be bought off. <laughs> <laughs> But here's for, my for substantially less money, I probably. No, 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 no. I have standards. There's going to be at least be five zeros in that check. <laughs> like five. I was saying, substantially less money. Um, <laughs> let's see. So the only two really good reviews were PC Gamer and Eurogamer Italy, which both rated it an 80 or better. Millennium gave it a 70. IGN Italy gave it a 70, but nobody really cares. God is a geek, but apparently not a reviewer, gave it a 70. Uh, gaming bottle gave it 70. Attack yeah. of the fam, like all these people are giving it 70s, 60s. Um, finally, you get down to IGN France, which gave it a 50. Uh, Checkpoint Gaming gave it a 50. Okay, my question to any of you people have you actually played Warhammer Vermintide 2 at all, or even PC for 
PC games, the best thing I can say about Dungeons and Dragons Dark Alliance is it feels like this is one of these titles you rented from a video store in the early 2000s to play through on a weekend, which probably tells you you shouldn't pay full price for it. Mm-hmm. But uh, they gave it a 40. Uh, Screen Rant gave it a 30. So, I mean, the yeah. graphics don't even look good for what it should be. It, it looks like the P, you know, the PlayStation 2 version of the game. So, I, I don't know. It, I just thought it was funny that we all pretty much agreed. Well, I guess maybe not everybody, but I don't really trust, you know, being France or Italy or, well, PC Gamer. Because, again, who owns that? I mean, who really owns PC Gamer? I mean, they're under... I don't, I don't. Yeah, they're probably somebody. But so this uh, this guy, this is a fan review. This is the worst game I've tried. It could have been fun if they fix all the bugs that exist, but I don't think this will happen. The most annoying part is that if you push a button to dodge, uh, is that you have to push a button to dodge, but you just can't because it completely lagged. <laughs> he gave it a <laughs> zero out of ten. Yeah, and that that's about you know par for the course. So, um, yeah, PC Gamer. Here, this one's better. It Future doesn't actually work <laughs> correctly, so you can't really call it a game. If it functioned correctly, it'd be a completely forgettable action game you might play one day on Game Pass or something since it's free anyway. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, it gets a three from us because the logo looked cool, but that's it. Um, no, uh, the publisher of PC Gamer is uh, Future Pick, which is out of England, and uh, yeah, they're a big corporation. That obviously... also, just to give you just to give you an idea of, of how big of a shill for our, for our viewers, I know I know Chad and and, and um, Marcus already know this, but just to give you a big of an idea of how big of a shill these gaming websites are for them, and how much they're just sucking at the teat of these gaming companies. This is an article called 10 major improvements to madden 2022 okay this is from ign coaching tree has been introduced outside of home field advantage another feature that madden 22 is seemingly lifting from ncaa 14 from ncaa 14 a major improvement to 22 from a decade ago that's pathetic (laughs) And this is the crap that IGN is touting is this is why you should pay $70 for the new generation game. Hail no. Scrub. <laughs> no. I mean, we'll definitely take some free copies from EA to host a Madden 22 uh, you know, party. But I also feel like we can just put Madden 21 in there and say, oh, it's Madden 22. <laughs> anyway. Um, all I can say is if you want to play Dark Alliance, uh, make sure you're trying it for free and don't waste any money on it or immediately go take it back once you're, you know, you're frustrated with the game. Honestly, if you actually, just wait if, a year for them to patch it. If you actually like, if you want to play something like that, then do what we do. Just play For Honor or play Vermintide 2. Okay? And both of those are games that you can actually download on Xbox uh, Game Pass. Uh, in fact, I think Vermintide 2 is free in PlayStation Now as well. So try it. All right, moving right along. Now, again, I, I granted it's not the 4th of July because uh, we were off last weekend, but we did want to talk about summer blockbusters that happened in July. And most importantly, uh, on the 4th of July, what movies do you watch? Now, the reason we're talking about it is It's a very special 25th anniversary of one of the best movies that ever came out on the 4th of July. Um, And the most obvious name that you can, you know, give a movie on the 4th of July. Independence Day. Yes, the original 1996 uh, alien invasion movie starring Jeff Goldblum, Will Smith, and Bill Pullman um, came out 25 years ago, as I was uh, reminded uh, by Alex Moore uh, earlier this year when he was talking about the best movies of 1996. Um, and then I realized, shit, it has been 25 years since Brendan and I graduated high school. And here we are. Yeah. Um, 
Now, I want to say this. I'm going to start off with Independence Day as one of the best movies you can watch on the 4th of July. It's We should note that this is a Roland Emmerich movie. It's not going... His movies are never going to be, like, great movies. They're disaster movies. They're fun movies. They, they're entertaining. They're the stuff that you go and watch on the big screen because yeah. special effects are great on the big screen. They're this Michael Bay gonna, light. They're Michael right. Bay light. Yeah. This is not going to be Shakespeare. No. This is right. not going to be high cinema. This is not going to be gone with the wind. This is going to be gone with the wind with explosions and aliens. Right. I'd like to think that the Michael Bay esque movies with a little with some better drama. Um you know, and a little bit better comedy. It's a Michael Bay movie with an actual script. Right, 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 right. Sort of. Uh, the entire script is not explosion here, you know, special effects shot here. There's a story. And tw- 25 years later, I can say this. I still have just as much fun watching this movie as I did the summer that it came out. You know, I remember all of my friends. That was the last big movie we went saw in the theater before everybody went off to college or the military you know i had friends that were leaving like the next week to go to the you know to the navy and the army and about a month later i was already gone to college um for two a days you know for football so you know it it's a fun movie and i think it still holds up in a lot of ways um you know the special effects and everything obviously you they're they're dated 25 years later. Uh, you know, they still hold up pretty well, though. Yeah, they don't, that's what I'm saying. I mean, they're dated, but it's not like dated like watching. What did I watch recently that was just, The Mummy Returns? Uh, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. With, with mutant <laughs> rock on top of a scorpion. <laughs> with, yeah. With that, PlayStation 1 era graphics, Scorpion King. Yeah. Yeah. That was given the people's eyebrow. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. That was just that was bad. I was I was remember I remember going to see that, and I remember being in the theaters. I remember the doors opening, and we're like, "Yeah, we're gonna about to see the rock put the rock bottom on the freaking uh on the mummy," and then right. that thing came out, and the collective the entire theater went, "What the fuck?" <laughs> <laughs> and apparently, apparently, ILM has a had a scale established at that time of what's good for the film, what's good for the film. Uh, what the computers can handle. Holy shit, we're about to hit critical mass and what Steven Summers wants is, is the top <laughs> of this. Which, by the way, is the guy who wrote that, is it the same guy who did Wild Wild West? Wouldn't surprise me. Um, mm-hmm. Just be, or the, the, the same producer. I'm, I got to look that up because, um, I, which by the way, dovetails nicely into the worst movies to, uh, released yes. in July. Um <laughs> But, uh, because Kevin Smith tells this great story on an evening harder with Kevin Smith, where he talks about doing um, Superman return of Superman, whatever the reborn. Thing. Yeah. Superman, Superman reborn. reborn. Right. That's what was what, yeah. the one that never got made with Nick Cage and Tim Burton. And he right. went and he wrote a script and they were like, okay, well we love the script, but at the end of it, we want you to have Superman fight a giant spider. And he's like, are you familiar with comics or Superman? <laughs> Or anything having anything to do with anything. And he's like, no, no, we want this. And and Kevin's like, yeah, I'm going to have to bail. Um, (laughs) No, remember, he did, he did, what was it? He called it a Thangarian snare beast or something like that. And and John was like, yes, that's it. Go, go with that. But but, but they got their mechanical spider in Wild Wild West. Mm -hmm. And yes, and then that's, and that was the next movie that guy did. Yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, by the way, you got to love a old fashioned like Western where the the technology is so advanced that, you know, it's like 100 years from the future that somehow ends up in the old West. Yeah, um, Steven, you're your 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 steampunk Kenneth Branagh villain, for Christ's sakes. Right. There's like there's literally no way. And, you know, Kenneth Branagh and his ridiculous over the top Southern accent about bringing back the Confederacy in his own army, and I've got no legs. It's just, that that movie, the only thing that it really had going for it is uh, Kevin Klein, who's good at anything he does, and he was funny. Okay. Hey, 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 hey. 
we had a kick-ass theme song. <laughs> That's true. And you and you held Selma Hayek and Selma Hayek's boobs. Mm-hmm. So and her butt. You know. Right. And her butt. Yes, exactly. yes. She's a breath of fresh ass. Uh, you just said she was a breath of fresh air. No, I didn't. I said she's a breast of fresh air. Hey, I'll say this. Uh, the fact that they were kind of making fun of her boobs uh, and Hitman's wife's bodyguard, that was like one of the best parts of that movie because it was no, not a most, very good movie. The most frightening okay. thing in the last couple of minutes is that Brendan knew that quote that fucking well. <laughs> it fucking scares the shit out of me. How right. many times have you seen Brendan? Um, I've probably uh, only seen it twice, but Kevin Klein's funny. Um, yeah, that's true. Funny anything he does. But anyway, getting back to Independence Day 25 years later, as I said, it it still holds up. It's still funny. Uh, there's a lot to a lot a lot to like about it. Uh, not so much the sequel that they decided to make 20 years later, which was like <laughs> without the main character. Yeah, right. With an off, with an off screen death. But he's gonna, but his son is going to save the day, and now we're going to go after the aliens and. I'm just speaking like, of which, speaking of fighter pilots, uh, fictional fighter pilot sons whose dad died previously, um, in Top Gun Maverick, Goose's son's call sign is Whiplash. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, played by. <laughs> but think about how Goose movie. died. Whip. I, I know. <laughs> I know. I was like, that shit's wrong on multiple levels. Well, I like how it's like we're trying to be funny with that call sign name, like. Not only was Miles Teller in that great movie called Whiplash with, you know, J.K. Simmons, but hey, Goose's, you know, his his fictional father and the way he died. That'll be, yeah, people will think it's hilarious. But no, you know what, though? I, no. Actually, in the Navy, though, that would totally happen. I mean, think of the guy who drew the sky penis. His name is Commander <laughs> Brendan Stickles, and his freaking call sign is Tess. Testicles. Yeah, Stickles. <laughs> Uh, of course he drew a sky penis no really it was just an arby's hat <laughs> now every time uh, you drive by arby's you're gonna think holy shit sky penis you're welcome <laughs> right 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 right, right. Go on. uh but anyway yes if you uh, i i feel like after 25 years uh we you know because we always talk about what's the most american thing you can do and blah 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 you know well, obviously, on the 4th of July, it's get drunk and, you know, shoot off fireworks and nearly kill yourself, you know, because <laughs> or in the ca- or in the sa- in the case of a Columbus Blue Jackets goalie, actually kill yourself. Oh, yeah. So oh, you had to bring that up. <laughs> yeah. Like people, I'm sorry. If you're drunk, leave the fireworks to somebody else, please. Leave them to the pros. Like, right. like, you know, some I, on Friday, I saw the most prophetic tweet ever. It was. It was uh, somewhere an American is celebrating his last weekend with 10 fingers. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't be funny if it wasn't so true. Like last, right. year, last year, last year, I'm sitting here and it was the weekend after like it was a couple of days after 4th of July and a couple of fire. And I actually even sent it out on Facebook too. It was like a couple of fireworks go off and not five minutes later, I hear fire trucks and ambulance coming into my apartment <laughs> complex. And it was like, well, that was nothing if not predictable. <laughs> I, I, I'm just saying that, you know, we're not advocating like a political stance on anything. We're just pointing out, you know, some general safety tips that stupid Americans should follow because it's just fireworks it's first, logical. alcohol later. Yeah, right. they don't win, they don't blend well. Anything that's explosive or can kill you like a firearm. You probably shouldn't be doing that while you're drinking. But then again, until you- five years ago, Texas did have a freaking drive through guns and liquor store down in Blanco. So, yeah, because, you know, that's a great idea. I'd like a margarita, 12 gauge and a carton of shells to go, please. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> what could it's gonna go be wrong? a hell of an afternoon? Yes. Right. But getting back to my point is, you know, we consider these things very American. And I'm like, that's great. Um, I, on the other hand, I'm going to be perfectly safe not operating anything that can kill me while I watch Independence Day over craft beer because I think that's also a very American thing to do. That that sounded like an old Guinness commercial from the early 2000s. Not shoot yourself with fireworks? Brilliant! (laughs) (laughs) And here's one of the reasons I love Independence Day. Now, 
our buddy Sean at our local pub always gives Brendan and I just shit when we talk about movies that are epic and nerd out. He just, you know, shakes his head and stuff like that. And I made the comment years ago that the movie Pacific Rim was an epic movie. I didn't say it was a great movie. I said it was epic because it was on the big screen and it's basically men and giant robots killing aliens. It was yeah. large in scale. Yeah, all, right. it's all about scale. It's all about scale. Right. But it also has, like Independence Day, one of the most epic, you know, speeches you can ever get. Bill Pullman in Independence Day. You know, we will not go quietly in the night. And, you know, we're going to take back our country, blah, blah, blah. And today will be our Independence Day. Is it hokey? Yes. Does it work for that movie? Fuck yes, it does. Okay. If that's also a better happen. speech than most of our actual presidents have given in the last <laughs> right. 25 years. So if that if that speech from Independence Day isn't borrowing from, you know, the South Park guys, America, fuck yeah, type of attitude, whatever. But Elder Zelda, I think, tapped into his Independence Day with Pacific Rim when he talks about today we're going to cancel the apocalypse, you know, Um they're going to be like great movies. They're just fun fucking movies to watch on the big screen. And I, again, Independence Day is just something you should watch and you should enjoy. You'll also be able to keep your ten fingers at the end of that movie. So, somebody After encapsulated uh, Independence Day, paraphrasing Pullman's speech, I think, perfectly uh, here. It says, in the past 25 years, Independence Day has held up as the largest, most bombastic movie in the history of patriotic cinema. Cinema. That word has new meaning today. We can't be consumed by our petty logic issues anymore, like how Jeff Goldblum and Judd Hirsch beat gridlock traffic in Washington, D.C. to get to the White House before the countdown clock went to zero. <clears throat> or how Will Smith knew how to command an alien spaceship. So perhaps it's fate that on the 4th of July, we will once again turn to this splendid cheese whiz entertainment. Not for its brilliant plotting or its nuanced character development or to catch a glimpse of the actress who played Kelly Kapowski's roommate on Saved by the Bell, the college years, but for our right to see a movie in which we don't have to use any brain cells. For the 4th of July should no longer be known as an American holiday, but as a day when director Roland Embrick gave us the reason to unite. We will not go quietly into that good night and stream The Karate Kid Part 3. We're we're going to go big and watch Randy Quaid fly up a flying saucer's ass and defeat slimy <laughs> aliens. Today, we celebrate our Independence Day. <laughs> America! Fuck yeah! <laughs> You're welcome, the internet. By the way, oh. poor Randy Quaid turned out to be crazy and thought <laughs> that Hollywood was a cabal. Turned out to be his character. character. Yeah, life imitating art. That was a fun character. I'm sorry. Uh, is it true that Randy Quaid was? Is it true that Randy? I've been looking forward that, to get the payback. Yeah. Is, is it true that Randy Quaid was method acting and nobody told him that the movie was over? <laughs> was he method acting or was he meth acting? <laughs> that, that too. Yeah, even at the end of the movie, when he sacrifices himself and you know goes up the anus of the alien ship. Hey, boys, I'm back. back. Oh, yours. Yours. which brings me to uh, I, I had a list and I did a call of like what are my favorite you know Fourth of July movies. If you're a musical fan, I think you should obviously watch 1776, um, which, you know, it's mostly a guy's musical. And I'm sorry, I'm going to say something very controversial here on this show. It's better than Hamilton. <gasps> it, is. it is. I know. And the movie that came out in the 70s uh, was great. Also, we've had the pleasure of interviewing Blythe Danner and talking about that movie with her uh, when she, she was here at the Dallas Film Festival uh, five years ago. So, uh, and she played uh, the young Mark Jefferson. 
in the movie. Um, and she was like, oh, I love doing musicals. They never give me musicals anymore, but I would be happy to do another musical. They would just give it to me. <laughs> I'm like, mm -hmm. bring it on. So I think the other, like if you do a double feature of like American movies, um, you got to go Independence Day just for the, the sheer fun of it. Um, and I think in our minds that if aliens invaded, that's how we would act, you know, in America. But the other one is like the most American, you know, revolutionary war, even though <laughs> it's not at all accurate. The Patriot with Mel Gibson before <laughs> he went crazy. And it's a fun movie. It has a great cast. Um, you know, a lot, lot of great one-liners in it. Uh, and you can't help but, you know, enjoy that movie all the way, you know, to the end. And Jason Isaacs makes one of the absolute best villains you know, so uh, I think the Patriots another good one. The other one, uh, the other two, uh, or the other one that I always kind of kid around that I think is like the, the most American thing. And you, even though it's not set on the Fourth of July, it should be watched on the Fourth of July. Is Red Dawn? You know, if there's if there's a movie out there that's like so pro America, and we're just not, just just remember, he's talking about the one that was actually released in the eighties. Right. We don't even acknowledge the other one. <laughs> what other one? Yeah, Just exactly. making sure. Just making sure everybody else knew that. No, no, no. We're talking about the one with Patrick Swayze and Charlie yeah. Sheen. Uh, yeah, there, yeah. There is no one. other one. There, there is no other one. There is no other one. Let's, let's you know. There, right. There is no one. But, I mean, that's exactly how I feel like, you know, America would be if we were invaded by Russians slash Cubans, you know, or whoever. If, if that ever happened and that movie if that movie did anything it gave if you didn't hate the russians to begin with you know kids really learned how to hate the russians from that movie and i love the fact that you can say wolverines and kids from the 80s know exactly what you're talking about boys avenge me avenge unless, me unless they're from michigan and then they're gonna get the wrong idea <laughs> yeah no shit <laughs> um, they mowed down bread from Alien, you bastards. Now, here, here's another movie. It didn't. It was an honorable mention for me personally, um, but because uh, I always throw in like John Wayne and the Alamo. I, I love his version of the Alamo, even though again it's not entirely accurate at all. But it's John Wayne and the Alamo movie, and it was you know and. John Ford was kind of like a second unit director. Still a fun movie. But if you really want to go kick ass, okay, and, you know, add a little history to Independence Day, I feel like you got to go with Nick Cage and National Treasure. Where mm -hmm. they, <laughs> not only do they steal the Declaration of Independence, but they preserve it from criminals while finding a secret treasure. And if that's not... <laughs> One of the most American I, things you can do. By going up George Washington's nose or in Lincoln's ear or whatever the hell. I, I can't remember how they got that. That was the second one, though. Oh, that's, uh, my bad. I'm sorry. Because that was the right. one where they go to the, that's the one where they go to, uh, yeah, they go to uh, Mount Rushmore. No, the first one, they steal the Declaration of Independence and then they find the Templar treasure buried under a church in Manhattan. Yeah. So, uh, but anyway, that's just some of those movies that I threw out there. So before we get to the rest of our topic, I wanted to ask, uh, starting with you, Chad, what is, uh, what's the one movie that you would absolutely watch on in, uh, on the 4th of July? My go-to? Um, well, let me grab a prop. <laughs> is it Purple Rain? No. <laughs> I figured... Jaws is an honorable mention for that because, for Christ's sake, it's the Fourth of July. It didn't come out on the Fourth of July. No, however, no. No. however, it does have one of the great Fourth of July sequences in a movie. You know, Killer Shark, the two little kids out there. You know, doing the trick. I love he the brother. Do it. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, he made, he made me do it. Yeah, every every year that's a must watch for me and. uh my wife and I, we we also make it a point. Granted, I know it was in the theatrical release, but we always uh, re replay uh, the HBO miniseries John Adams. 
Oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Great, great miniseries. And yes, yeah. you can get them on HBO Max. Now, but if we're talking movies that opened on 4th of July weekend that aren't patriotic, it's, uh, and I may be stealing a couple, you know, one or both of you guys' thunder here, but it's a close race between Back to the Future and Terminator 2. Yeah, those are on the list. I got some other ones, though. Oh, so do oh, I. Yeah. So do I but, and but we're going to talk, talk about that in a minute. But, Brendan, what's a go-to movie for you on 4th of July? Uh, well, you nailed two of my big ones with The Patriot and uh, and uh, Independence, Independence Day. But let's um, let's take a, a, another route. Um this is going to go a different way. It's not a big bombastic movie, although it is patriotic in, in, a, in a way. Um, let's go with Article 99. Ooh. Which I know a lot of people don't know, but I mean, it's Keith or Sutherland from a long time. It was Keith or Sutherland pre-24 when he talked like this all the time, like he was trying to be Batman. Um, <laughs> you know, so... You I just, uh, yeah. Um, so, and it's, it's all about just you know set oh god how when how long ago did that movie come out of the 80s uh no that's uh, uh 1990 but ray liotta Forrest yeah. Whitaker. um so like 1992 Kamala. but yeah and it came out in 1992 and here we are like 50 like 25 years later um in the mid 20 2010s and the va s- scandal in phoenix comes out and everybody's like oh i had no idea this was going on i'm like really they did a movie about it in 1992 man like <laughs> yeah I mean, it was a fictional story, but not really. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it, but if you're looking at besides just being patriotic and we want our independence and blah, 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 blah. But if you want to look at real serious issues of, you know, doctors going all out to care for vets and taking a hospital or also Keith David uh, in the wheelchair. I mean, it's a fantastic yeah, and, movie it's just I mean, so wonderful so Ray Liotta Keith the Subble and Force Whitaker Leah Thompson who let's face it everybody loves Leah Thompson John Mahoney uh, John C. Mc, John C. McGinley before he was in Scrubs uh, was, Lee, was Leah Thompson she was in that movie wasn't yep. she mm-hmm. holy shit yeah it's a great cast and sadly it didn't do shit at the box office it bombed it didn't even make its budget back mm. but I, I guess America wasn't ready to see how in 1992 post, uh, you know, post Gulf war one, when everybody was still tying a yellow ribbon around the old Oak tree, they weren't ready to see how badly the VA treated all the people that they were just talking about how we support our troops. Man, nah, not really. <laughs> right. So Interesting. Huh. People weren't ready for that conversation. No. So, um, Wow, that's a great one to do. All right, but moving right along and talking about movies that came out in July, uh, the best and the worst. And I'm going to start with uh, Terminator 2. Um, it, it's kind of funny that we talk about it. I noticed that it popped up on Netflix during the 4th of July weekend, and it's you know it's one of the top 10 movies people are going back and watching. Uh, how do you not go back and watch it? That movie's and that movie is thirty years old this year. It came out in ninety one, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. And it, you know, spawned so many memes, <laughs> <laughs> which is impressive for a movie that came out twenty something years before memes were a thing. Right. Um, you know, uh, I think my favorite one is uh, the conversation between. Uh, T-800 and T-1000 as John Connor's step uh, or foster mother. Oh, and yeah. uh, and it turns they turn it into a meme and it's uh, it's uh, when you play D&D, do you like to DM or do you like to be the player? Oh, I like to DM, honey. I'm sorry, your parents are dead. <laughs> uh, now, I, I mean, for sci-fi, you know, geeks and stuff like that i mean that is like one of the biggest movies that came out on the fourth of july weekend and one of the most easily anticipated movies i i remember i think a couple years before i finally got to watch like the first terminator movie because it was one of those underrated sci-fi movies that just really caught on and, and gained a cult following on vhs and then they when they announced 
they're doing it too. And oh, by the way, Arnold's going to be the good guy this time. You're like, what? What's going how? on here? But, but how? Yeah. How? But I mean, this was the first major role by Robert Patrick. <laughs> and he absolutely nails, you know, the uh, the liquid metal Terminator. Um, and you talk about special effects that still absolutely hold up 30 years That's later. I was going to say, yeah, they, they age very well. Right. I mean, because they were mostly practical. Um, I mean, they were for the liquid metal, they literally used like, I think it was, uh, I think it was heated uh, lead. Um. So it actually was liquid metal uh, when they're, you know, when they're doing it, when they're doing the, um, the all the metal coming together. Now the part where okay. it's like forming into a man, obviously it's, it's yeah. not, but they were wow. using, I think, uh, liquid lead and they were had it on a table with like a, a, a gimbal or something. So it would all kind of slide together. So it was actually liquid metal that was sliding together. It was an right. actual practical mm-hmm. effect. And, and I also want to say this about this, uh, about that movie. If you were a prepubescent teenager when that movie came out or a teenager or, or in your early 20s, um, it's okay to admit that you absolutely fantasize, <laughs> you know, about what's her face in that movie. Sarah uh, Connor, Linda Hamilton. Yeah. Um, but well, that, that and, uh, you know, it did like it was kind of the so- swan song to uh, Axl Rose's vocal career um because <laughs> use your illusion one and two were basically the entire soundtrack and yeah. um after that like let's not talk about the spaghetti incident that was just a terrible record <laughs> um so like like guns and roses hit its peak it was like you know some shit nobody heard of appetite for destruction use your illusion one or two and then fall off the face of the earth Somebody right. was like, what happened to Axl Rose and Guns N' Roses? I was like, cocaine's a hell of a drug. Uh, <laughs> I did a video for November Rain, I rest my case. Yeah. yeah. Or don't very, cry. Very, very mm-hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, I, that is one of the, the, one of the best ones. Uh, I agree that Back to the Future is another great one, which, you know, is 36 years old now. And also a great soundtrack. Had, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, for, I had forgotten it had come out actually during fourth of july weekend i remember going to see it during the summer but i think i saw it you know like a, a month after it had, it had you know come out um so but yeah that's another great one too uh, i want to give a shout out to a friend of the show uh david uh matthew who is uh we know from all the cons here he is a huge cosplayer uh great fantastic uh, guy and literally has the best back to the future cosplay i mean has really gone all out to do all the props exactly everything uh that he does um from not only the first movie but the second movie uh i mean he's just he, he he's the one guy that i know always has great props with his cosplay uh last year when uh all con, you know, got shut down on opening night. Uh, he was cosplaying. Uh, he actually had the telephone boat, uh, telephone booth from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Uh, that we were talking about him making that, I folded it up and trying to get it into his car and uh, stuff like that uh, at the end of the evening. But anytime I think about Back to the Future, I always think of him. And I've even got a couple of the uh, Save the Clock Tower. Uh, flyers on blue paper from him so but anyway all right yeah, back to it, the it, it, it might be worth mentioning that there there recently it was an opening uh, of a, of an of an of an art gallery in, that, that's local in flower mound that i attended last weekend that's owned and run by uh, uh a couple of names that i'm sure a, a co- you know most of you would be familiar with philip wise and Ben Stevens, and they've teamed up with Drew Struzan, and uh, the Back to the Future artwork is featured very prominently in this gallery, obviously, because Struzan did all the poster art, Uh, and if you're feeling froggy and have a couple of, of, oh, I don't know, extra 10, 20, 30, 40 thousand dollars to spend, uh, you can get the original uh, prints that Struzan drew, that painted, 
they they've got wow. some I'll, I'll post it yeah I'll, I'll i'll send you guys some of the pictures that i took but they've got they've got some amazing artwork but uh uh like the first thing that you see when you open is drew's signature when you go through the gallery doors is drew's signature on the wall next to a life-size boba fett action figure with a firing rocket on his back but uh it's 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 an absolute uh wonderful place to get lost in uh but you know yeah the back to the future artwork is featured very very prominently in there well you know good taste and all i yes. uh, i can't complain that now here's something i in, in doing a little research before the show here's something that i didn't realize actually came out during the fourth of july weekend because i never saw it in the theater i'm like many people discovered it on vhs in a video store coming to america is a fourth yep. of july movie mm -hmm. i just didn't even i Where did are we not go to that. find a queen queens <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and that's a fantastic movie. How do you not love that movie? You can you can complain about the sequel that may not that probably shouldn't have been made. It was I, I haven't been able to bring myself to watch it, to be honest. <laughs> I wanted to. I just couldn't pull the trigger. It's OK. It, it, it wasn't is horrible. It wasn't horrible, but it's, it's nowhere near what. What the original was it's not even close no 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 not at all um yeah. they they're obviously trying to recapture the same magic and you know kind of reuse the same jokes that made us it, it, it's it's nostalgic that's that's all it really gets um and new cast members you know were really well and it, you know i i love the fact that you brought back sexual chocolate <laughs> But he was sequel. criminally underutilized. Criminally underutilized. That boy good. Yeah. Sexual chocolate. That boy good. <laughs> but I got my uh, Prince moment. I got my Prince moment in that movie, so I ain't complaining about that. Right. Uh, I also don't buy the fact that all of the old guys at the barbershop are still alive after. No shit. Years. <laughs> like, really? Uh, but hey, do what you. You know, want to do to make a movie, but the first one is just so purely magical, um, and stuff. I think one of my favorite stories is uh, just to offset everything is how Louis Anderson got in the movie. They were basically uh, looking for a white guy <laughs> to work the flies or whatever, and Eddie Mur Murphy knew him from comedy, and they're like, "Well, just get Louis Anderson; he's funny." And Lou Anderson gets a call one day and like, would you like to be in the Sunny Murphy movie? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. And then there's, you know, Samuel Jackson as the guy Robin McDowell's. Right. And by the way, how do you not get Samuel L. Jackson to do a quick cameo as like the, a reformed criminal or something like that? Because they couldn't afford it. Well, I know. <laughs> I guess they didn't. Sam, Sam's gotten a little bit more popular since then. Well, I guess they scope. didn't have the, uh, the Shaft movie budget uh, where they were able to get all three generations of Shaft. Yeah, uh, yeah. Man, which, by the way, point. was not a bad, uh, you know, see, uh, well, I guess third movie in the series or whatever. Uh, but yeah, Coming to America. It's fourth of, I never really thought of that as a Fourth of July movie or something you would see on the Fourth of July as and everything but it is one of the greatest comedies of the 80s and works very well now i think there is one other movie that we have to talk about that is a fourth of july movie um and one of the the best movies that ever come out in july i'm not saying anything about the sequels i just think it's hilarious that two years in a row William, will smith did alien movies and the sequel and the second one being um, Men in Black, Men in, Black. in 1997. Well, you know, if if it's working for you, stick with it. Yeah. Um,
did have it, one of the, the best little rap songs from the 90s uh, that, that we all remember. It, it's it's funny that he's on this list three times, but tw- twice for the best and once for the worst. <laughs> As the the worst one is After Earth, right? Well, I was well. I don't think that's a. I don't think that's a, di- uh, a July Fourth movie. No, I was saying Wild Wild West. Oh, that's right. That's um, yeah. <laughs> but I, I do want to say something real quick about a movie that came out this Fourth of July weekend. Um, so, Tomorrow War Two, not as bad as everybody says it is. Not nearly as good as some people think it is. Probably a six or a seven, right? <laughs> Would that be fair? I gave it a seven. I- okay. So yeah. here's the thing. They're already talking about a sequel. And in the sequel, can we please just give Chris Pratt a gun that makes sense? Because this is my dialogue of Chris Pratt going to the armor to get his gun to go into the future. The creatures are damn near bulletproof. Do you want a round that gives you a chance like 308 or even a 6.5 Credmore? Nah, 5.56 five, five, will do. How, would you like decent barrel length for accuracy? No, a 7-inch barrel. Okay, adjustable stock then, going for close quarters barrel. Now nah, give me a big heavy stock, and I'm going to need optics too. Why? With a seven inch barrel, bruh, I'm going to need optics. Okay there, Captain Tactical. But <laughs> just once, I wish Hollywood directors would hire a good military advisor, and if they do, please listen to them. And yeah. frankly, if you're going 50 years into the future to fight a war, why wouldn't they have better gear? To quote Simon Phoenix from Demolition Man, this is the future. Where are all my ray guns at? Yeah. Where's Dale Die when you need him? Yeah, yeah right, like, exactly. I, I, I did find that kind of interesting. It's like you have the ability to come back to the future to conscript people, but somehow you don't bring back better technology for those people. <laughs> oh, big. It's, like, it's like, look, it was a fun movie. It was an enjoyable movie. It, not a lot of thought went into it. <laughs> I, it, it it's kind of this fun little the sci-fi movie that you would throw in there. And, and, and here's the thing. I find it interesting on the 25th anniversary of Independence Day, we had two alien invasion movies that come out about the same time. One of them is Operation Rainfall, which, you know, speaking with uh, Dan Ewing and uh, uh, who was the lead actor and, you know, Luke Spark, who was the writer and director, it's just a fun movie. And that's all they did. It was just an homage. They weren't trying to be serious or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> it, but they know what it is and you know great special effects and fun and you're able to set up a trilogy with the Tomorrow War I think the Tomorrow War expected to be a much more serious movie and I'm like no you've already ruined that with your premise of we have nobody in the future to fight aliens so we've got we can go back in time and reverse Terminator and bring people to the future to fight but we don't have better technology. <laughs> we got we can do time travel, but our guns suck. But right, right. Like also, I said, not a lot of thought. Yeah. Also, all of that and your plot and your major plot point. A little bit of a spoiler is the kid who really loves to talk about volcanoes being able to save the day <laughs> by talking about volcanoes. Mm-hmm. Things that. The only two times we've ever seen where volcanoes, you know, were a serious major plot point. Joe versus the volcano with Tom Hanks. And then Dante's Peak with Linda Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't hate that movie. I think it's kind and of the fun. only time the only time the a volcano was used in a movie where it wasn't utterly ridiculous was Lord of the Rings. <laughs> exactly. Like, hey, we can't forget about the Tommy Lee Jones volcano either, the one that erupted in the middle of L.A. Well, well, LA oh, yeah. my God. I forgot about that. Yeah, the, the 1997, we get two movies about volcanoes. Well, that one was of them a... sort of makes sense because it's near a volcano in the Pacific Northwest. But, sure, something breaks and lava starts coming up through the streets of L.A. Yeah. yeah. Of course. And, and look, reasons. I can... <laughs> And that was a theme, though. Did you ever notice that? Like, Hollywood did that in the 90s. Oh, all the time. There, there was oh, always oh. <laughs> a copycat. So you had Dante's Peak and you had Volcano. You had Armageddon and Deep Impact. Like, it was like every year there was one movie that copied another movie. And it was like, why is the second one either bothering? Because, you know, like, the first one's going to get all the moviegoers and the second one, nobody's going to bother. 
Well, right. one that where, where like, Dudley Moore and Kirk Cameron swap bodies, and then you had Judge Reinhold and his kid in a body swapping movie, uh, and yeah, all that and, shit. And, and that was just, you know, it's just look, and that was just a, a rip off of Disney's Freaky Friday, which then they yeah. let it ripped off again. But yeah. Turner yeah, and Hooch and K9 yeah. and blah 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 blah, just kidding. Yeah, on it's like on. it was like a 90s tradition. It was like, why are you doing this anyway? <laughs> just something that triggered in my head when you talk about Volcano and Dante's Peak. You know, and that and that's kind of actually it, it's sad that we talk about Hollywood doing that because you know Deep Impact is obviously the better movie than Armageddon, but everybody remembers Armageddon because of its clever one-liners and sheer ridiculous action and whatnot. Because Michael. you know, it's totally plausible that our plan would literally be, of course, we're going to set down on a moving asteroid and drill a hole in it with <laughs> well drillers. And That's, we're going to nuke it. Yes, totally. But we get this, but we get a really popular Aerosmith song out of it. <laughs> it's actually a terrible so, song. Yeah, I, I didn't say it was good. He said, said it was popular. popular. Yeah. He say good Fair, one. Fair enough. Impact, I, yeah, I, I, I yield story. the point. I yield the floor. Yeah, but Deep Impact just had the better story. And, you know, Elijah Wood, who you know, races across the hills of Colorado on his dirt bike with his girlfriend and the young baby, and somehow they miraculously make it to, you know, the underground bunkers. Uh, what happened like to that here, If I got to choose between, if I got to choose, uh, Elijah Wood, he had, uh, I don't know. No, oh, hers, but, hers. Oh. When Lily Sobieski, the, like the younger version of Helen Hunt kind of shit. Oh yeah, yeah. She, she took a she took a like a series of bad roles in a row, and it just kind of ended her career. Um, well, she was still finding work. It's just she also got married and had two kids and took time off to you know raise children. So committed career but, suicide basically just because she wanted to be a mother. Uh, <laughs> all I know is Damn, uh, Chad. No, I'm just saying uh, that, that's yeah. career suicide in Hollywood for women in a lot of cases. Have a kid, okay, your career's over. <laughs> You're dynamic. It's crap. I'm just saying it's you know. Am, am I wrong here? No, <laughs> I, I was just up? saying. Damn, it's dark. Uh, anyway, but yeah, um, I know it sucks. Well, you know, you know that's uh, hopefully maybe you know maybe that now that's changing since uh, Harvey Weinstein's got nothing <laughs> to do with Hollywood anymore. Um, wow. wow. Yeah, that was. <laughs> You know, it's really cringeworthy. Go back a few years and watch all the women thanking Harvey Weinstein at the Oscars. Yeah. Back, that, you want that, to age, over on that? that age like a wet fart in church. Um, <laughs> Didn't Meryl Streep yeah. refer to him as the God at some point on one of her acceptance yeah. speeches? Like, yikes. Yeah. And some of the things that Gwyneth Paltrow said about him. And whew, yeah, the effusive praise was, was heaped on that man. Uh, anyway. Let's move on from that dark chapter of Hollywood uh, back to uh, movies we actually care about. Um, I got so here. Let's, let's let 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 oh, me let ahead. me throw one. Let me throw one from the worst because we've done some best. Let me do some from the worst. And it's sad because this one made more money than the remake, which was actually a better version of it. But Judge Dredd, <laughs> <laughs> the, I am the law. <laughs> Uh, which paid so little attention to the source material had dread taking his helmet off every five minutes. Cause Stallone wanted his face on there and it actually made more money than Carl Urban's dread and Carl Urban's dread was a awesome and B he actually paid attention to the character. So, right. I, you know, if any movie deserved a sequel that didn't get one in the last 10 years, it was probably dread. Uh but but here's the thing, Brendan. You're overlooking the most important part of the Sylvester Stallone version. Anytime you have Rob Schneider as the plucky sidekick, it's going to be a winner in any movie. <laughs> Dread? Going to, going to because, jail for saving my own ass? Because of nothing else, at least his character knows how to use the three she, uh, seashells. That's right. <laughs> oh, my God. I, yeah, I didn't even realize how can they make? How can the two of them make Demolition Man and freaking Dread? <laughs> That's like the yin and yang of suck right there. Uh, <laughs> one's good and the other's not. 
Look, I I love Rob Schneider. I mean, he has. Uh, I love how he does various characters in any in any Adam Sandler movie. Um, you know, but his greatest role will always be the football announcer. <laughs> Necessary, necessary roughness, roughness. and oh, at because, halftime, and, 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 and at halftime, the Texas State Marching Band will present its tribute to gun racks and open beverage containers, which is only <laughs> legal in Texas. Right, right. Which, by the way, just tied right back into our drive-through guns and liquor store and our fireworks discussion. <laughs> yeah, it does, uh, <laughs> hey, God bless America and Texas. Now, yeah. just now. Now I'm just thinking about Will Ferrell as George W. Bush during like one of the greatest parodies of a debate. Uh, are you messing with Texas? Uh, Governor, I listen closely. I don't believe he was messing with Texas. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, so, but anyway, in dread though, and then you've got Amar- Ar- Armand Asante like phoning in the one of the cheesiest, hammiest villain performances this side of Jeremy Irons and Dungeons and Dragons. And... <laughs> Yeah, you're welcome for that, Chad. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that response. Mm. Uh, you know, and then you got poor Max von Sydow. <sighs> this man is a phenomenal actor. He's been around for decades. He's worked with titans of acting, and 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 he got stuck in this. He got and played. and and, and they they had it. And J.J. Abrams said, hey, great, we got Max von Sydow for The Force Awakens. Let's keep him in the movie for five minutes and then shoot him. Mm. Right, right. <laughs> I'm Fuck like, you, J.J. Abrams. It, 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 at least Game of Thrones gave him a season, you know. Yeah. At least got to do like ten episodes or nine or however many he was in. Right. Um, but look, I mean, I, I'm not worried about him in Dread. He already has his movie where he played the greatest villain. And that's Flash, Gordon. Yeah. <laughs> Megan the Merciless. As, because of as cheesy film. as that movie is, it was still better than Dread. Uh, Young <laughs> and my unhealthy love for that film. All I right. have a very unhealthy obsession with Flash, Gordon. Yes, you do. All right, so I'm going to bring up one of the best movies ever come out on 4th of, 4th of July weekend uh, that we still love today. Uh, it's 26 years old. Apollo 13. I was and figuring that you were going movie, Absolutely stands the test of time. Houston, no problem. Man, honestly, I, I feel like you couldn't have cast that movie any better with who you had. Um, even all like the little bit parts by all the people that worked at NASA, you know, um, there's just can you honestly find any bad thing about that movie? I, I can't. Anytime that movie's on cable, I will absolutely watch it. I can, I can, I can. You can find one bad thing about that movie? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Not enough Clint Howard. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> um, you know, it, and it's kind of funny that about, like, Tom Hanks getting Best Actor, uh, Best Actor again, you know, for Forrest Gump. And I'm like, I honestly thought he should have gotten it for Apollo 13. I thought, yeah. I thought that. I thought he was better in that than you know Forrest Gump but uh, that I mean just again that movie alone being able to see that movie 25 years over after the real Apollo 13 uh, and just everything they did they put it together special effects flying I mean I even love the old actress that played you know his mother it's like are you scared yes hey if they could fly a washing machine, my Jimmy could land it. <laughs> <laughs> Her beautiful optimism. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean. I, but aren't, aren't all great mothers that way, though? I mean, and not to take anything away from the lady, but yeah, they all great mothers should be that way. They should have that confidence in their sons and their daughters. So, oh, but uh, right, I'm going to take us back because I know we're, we're kind of running on here, but I'm going to take us back to the, to the horrible side of Fourth of July movies. And I want you to think of how many amazing Native American actors we have out there. Graham Greene, Wes Studi, Adam Beach, all these wonderful Native American actors. And in Lone Ranger, we got a face-painted Captain Jack Sparrow. 
I was wondering how long this is going to take before it came up. Oh my god! I I was going to bring it around, but thank you. Yes. Oh my lord, have mercy! You even there have so- like a decent cast in that movie. Yeah. And, and you got discount Jack Sparrow with face paint. It, it it all he is doing is trying to be a Native American version of Jack Sparrow. Mm-hmm. That's all it was. I, I mean, you talk about trying to fucking phone, I mean, phoning in and, and collecting your paycheck. Wow. So like Jack Sparrow how- was Jack Sparrow was interesting when it first came out because it was like, yeah, I wanted this character to be a little different. So I made him basically Han Solo meets Keith Richards. And sure. I was like, and, and it was, I mean, it literally, you could see that play out. And I was like, that's fantastic. That's actually a great idea. And it played out wonderfully. But this is the fourth time you're playing in this, th- that exact same character. And by the way, in a movie, you shouldn't be playing that character. I know. I, I, it, I, it, there it's is, just terrible. There is just literally, and there was no reason to even make that movie. It, I don't, has anybody even watched it after the first time that they saw it? I mean, we did a press screening of it and was like, okay, you made a Lone Ranger movie and nobody gives a Oh, by the way, and it was the same director who directed uh, Pirates Pirates of the Caribbean, too. It was Gore Verbinski. Um, Yeah. So, yeah. And then look at your lead actor. Look at your lead actor and look at that fall from grace recently. Yeah, Army Hammer, yeah. But, I mean, and it does have a great cast. You know, William Fitcher, Tom Wilkinson, Ruth Wilson, who, by the way, is just devilish in Luther. Uh, Helena Bottom Carter, you know, Barry Pepper. But then, you know, you look down and I'm like, this is a movie called The Lone Ranger. I remember watching that show growing up, the reruns and yeah. Nick at Night and stuff. And, you know, they had a lot of, you know, there were a lot of interactions with Native Americans in that show. And, and like, I'm going down the list and I'm not seeing any. <laughs> yeah. Like, how do you, so, what does how, this how do teach you do us? Them? What does this teach us? Do not remake old Western television shows as big budget films and release them on the 4th of July weekend. Don't do it. Don't no. fucking do it. Don't. Like, I think there was more. To take, like what, a classic. I mean, because you know there's some pinhead out there. It's like, we can totally make a modern day version of Gunsmoke and it's going to be awesome. No, just don't. No. There, was or, one, there was one Native, Native American in that whole movie. His yeah. name is Saginaw Grant. That's it. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> All right. I'm going to mention, we're going to mention two more movies before we close this out. And I, and the one I want to bring up is one of the best movies that ever come out of 4th of July, even though it was a box office failure at the time because of, of other movies it was competing with. Uh, and this one's out to uh, our squad leader, Scott Cooper, because this is one of his all time favorite movies Big Trouble in Little China. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you yes. for mentioning this. Yes. Well, it, it's on the spectrum because people don't consider it like very good because it was a box office play. And I'm like, you also understand that like two weeks prior, Aliens came out <laughs> with James Cameron. And people were like on their third t- time going to see that movie. But Big Trouble in Little China, I mean, it is it is completely cheesy. There's no denying that. But it's just an absolute fucking fun movie. Okay. Yeah. Well, John Carpenter had spent so many time, so many years doing horror movies. He's like, you know what? I'm just going to have fun. Right. And guess what? The whole cast did too. And it came through. It showed up. You know, it is just, it's a delightful movie. It's bonkers and out of this world. And it doesn't take itself seriously. No. It's fantastic. How, how, it's, do you uh, look, how do you look at this? And not want to go see it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like... I, 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 what I love about this movie is if you ever wanted an excuse to just have Kurt Russell, you know, wear a tank top for the hell of it, there you go. Uh, Don't you no have a spare key? Of course I do, but it's under the, under the seat. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, he yells it. Also, and then he curves over the, turns over the engine. What was that? 6.5 on the Richter scale. <laughs> <laughs> Also, Kim Cattrall, before Sex and the City, and she kind of became crazy and, you know, controversial or just whatever, when she was still kind of up and coming and was doing fun roles and just 
absolutely fucking gorgeous, even with ridiculous makeup on. Um, of course, I mean, my personal opinion, the last great role she ever did was Star Trek Undiscovered Country. There isn't anything that I've ever, ever wanted to watch after that with her. But, but yeah, I mean, how do you not consider that just an absolute fun movie and very kind of typical of the 80s where you're just like no we're just going to do this ridiculous action movie uh, I think you know. my favorites my favorite scene the best scenes of that movie aren't even the action scenes they're the little interactions between the characters it's like when they're walking to go to the big climactic battle and Jack's like hey egg let me share that umbrella with you and the other the other younger Asian man says Come on, Jack, a brave warrior likes to feel a nature on his face. And Egg Shan replies, Yeah, and a wise man has enough sense to get out of the rain. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a I have a I have a theory about the movie uh Tango in Cash with Sylvester Stallone and uh Kurt Russell. Uh, yeah. No, hear my theory out. I think because Big Trouble in Little China was so fucking fun. And if you really look at uh Kurt Russell's character in Tango and Cash. It's it's very very similar, okay. Yes. But also, if you ever watched uh, kind of an underrated '80s action movie, Cobra with Sylvester oh, Stallone. Yeah, I think somebody looked at those two movies and like, we got to get put these them two actors together. <laughs> Tango and Cash, which I am not, I don't disagree with, because Tango and Cash is a fun fucking movie. Jack Palance is great. And I'm sorry, it's the only time you'll ever see on screen action star Kurt Russell having to escape in drag. Yes. <laughs> and also, it's just that turnaround where he looks at the cop. Flicks the cigarette the- at him. <laughs> but, <laughs> and a very young Terry Hatcher as well. And a very mm-hmm. young Terry Hatcher. Playing uh, Sly's yeah. sister. Tango and Cash that is born out of those two movies, Cobra and Big Trouble in Little China by putting Stallone and Kurt Russell in the same movie. And it works. So, all right. Uh, I'm going to end with one movie that again uh, is a perfect, perfect 4th of July movie if you are a baseball fan. And with the All-Star Weekend coming up um, in actual baseball, which I know we don't talk sports, uh, I'm only mentioning it because it's, it's a movie that kind of goes along with that. Um, one of the greatest baseball movies ever. No, it's not Bull Durham. It's not Field of Dreams. But we are talking A League of Their Own with Tom Hanks and um, Gina Davis. And Madonna uh, and a whole bunch Madonna of other people. And Rosie O'Donnell. And by the way, it's the one mm-hmm. movie where Rosie O'Donnell is not annoying. <laughs> and Robert Wool. Uh, Robert Wool. Yeah. Yeah, that, that movie's great. Are you are yeah. you crying? There's no crying in baseball. <laughs> Only if hey. you win. Only if yeah. you're in the World Series, then you're allowed. Right. Or if or if like Hank Aaron dies, you know. I mean, like, something like that's allowed. But right. uh, but, <laughs> but yeah, before the before the summer's over, we've got to do our we got to do our favorite baseball movie podcast. I know we've, we've probably it already done it, but it's definitely uh, worth uh, talking about again. Um, and stuff because there's some great ones, right? But it's the one time where, yes, Tom Hanks is not really the main star of this movie, he steals the show in a lot of ways. But you have such great female or actresses that kind of steal this movie, um, that really aren't doing a whole lot today. Love or hate Madonna, Madonna was great in this movie, yeah. All right, Rosie O'Donnell, too, and um, the one that played uh, the actress that played Kit from um, Lori Petty. Lori Petty, from, yeah. From uh, Point Frank, too. It, it, there's so many little truisms about baseball. It's such a great homage to, you know, the uh, the women's sports leagues uh, or, or professional baseball that happened during World War II when the men were all fighting, you know, that kept America entertained and stuff like that so and of course again tom hanks he's it's one of the best movies he's ever done I, I think my my literally my favorite scene of him is when he comes rushing to the church come on come on god knows we have a game today and just does this 
And I'd like to thank you to uh, the girl that was in Tulsa. Um, you know who she is. She said your name a lot. She kept saying your name. <laughs> uh, I like when what the, the scout was like, uh, I was especially impressed whenever you scratched your nuts for half the inning. He goes, well, anything worth doing is worth doing right. Worth doing right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I had forgotten that it had come out during the 4th of July. And I mean, 4th of July, I, I think there's just certain things that go with it in America that are very traditional. Yes. Obviously, drinking beer and eating hot dogs and grilling and shooting off fireworks and hoping you don't lose your fingers. But baseball is also a very important aspect of it. Um, it's like an honorable mention. If you want to talk about movies didn't come out during the 4th of July, but I think it's kind of a 4th of July movie, is The Sandlot, where they talk about it was the one time during the year where they got to do night baseball because of all the fireworks. Mm -hmm. And... That's a very old school childhood thing when you didn't have video games or the internet or anything like that, but you had, you're just outside playing. So 4th of July, you know, grilling hot dogs, fireworks and all that and playing baseball. And you're not yeah. in trouble. You're dead where you stand. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that's kind of like my pick. Now, I mean, I, I, I'm curious do you consider that one of the uh, the top five uh, baseball movies ever made, Chad? The Sandlot? Well, I was saying A League of Their Own. But, a League I mean, of Their I Own. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because right. it was a baseball movie that didn't – yes, it was all based around them playing the game, but it didn't feel like we were being beaten over the head by a, a baseball bat. To remind us it was a baseball movie, it was more about the – the, the people involved more than the game itself. It, it, it kind of transcended the sport. Yet I would also agree. And I would say that it uh, showed us how to subvert expectations while still telling a good story. Ryan Johnson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan Johnson. Uh, I'm never no, letting no, that go. No for, yeah. I was about to say Ryan Johnson is not getting any forgiveness from you. And, and, All and, right, and, before why, we... and somebody tell me why his head is shaped like a soccer ball. Because somebody needs to kick it. <laughs> Brendan, I can't answer that question. It's the same question I had about why did I serve with a guy at Fort Bliss who literally had a head shaped like a football and looked like Sloth from the Goonies. Oh, I was going to say, if he turned his head sideways, he looked like Stewie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when the drill sergeant is – you know, coming out to formation and walking past you and you're on the front row. Do you need a baby Ruth? <laughs> well, you know, and I'm glad, I, I know we got to wrap things up, but I'm glad that you mentioned uh, Sloth because that's from the Goonies. Jeez. And as you have noticed, I'm rocking yep. the Superman tee because this is, for me, one of the representations of a great 4th of July movie, even though it's got nothing to do with the 4th of July, but because Superman right. is the great... Well, hey, truth, great, justice, in the American way. Right, the right. great... Did we just lose Chad? Immigrant story. Okay, there we go. And we, yeah, we, we lost a true icon of cinema this week who was right. consistent in bringing us summer blockbusters with the Lethal Weapon franchise and the Goonies and... Um, Superman 2, I believe, even though he didn't direct all of it, but he directed most of it. Um, we're talking about, of course, the great Richard Donner. And uh, we really can't discuss summer movies and summer blockbusters without at least mentioning his name. And it's it, it was a great loss to Hollywood this week. And thank you for bringing that up. That was actually how, how I wanted to close this uh, show out, is remembering Richard Donner and all the great movies that he brought us, uh, summer blockbusters and stuff like that. And I will also say this. Nope, he died. You can't make a Lethal Weapon 5. There's no reason to. Sorry. Or Goonies, or Goonies 2, because I know they were talking about that no, as well. No, no, you cannot do a Goonies 2. Don't, because there's no way they don't screw that up, even if he's yeah. still alive. Like, you, just in today's cinema, you know it's going to get screwed up. Just leave the We've Goonies We've already got alive. a Goonies 2. It's called, it's called Stranger but, Things. We've already got yes. it. I, 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 I will say this about a Goonies 2. If you, because what, Sean Asson talked about years ago at a convention uh, is if you do it in the vein where it's, you know, it is their own kids who get together and, you know, kind of a reunion among the parents and, and stuff like that and go off an adventure. I can see that sort of working. 
Will it be as good as the original? No. Um, but you, it's kind of like, okay, I kind of get it. However, if you don't have the perfect 80s soundtrack to go with it, then just stop. Mm -hmm. You try to, if you try to have music from today or like sit, shit that millennials would listen to, no. I mean, the soundtrack, I think, is also what helps make, you know, Goonies, um, you know, iconic. And... But did, he, did he happen to mention what happened to the prop that he walked away with from that film, Marcus, when you talked to him? Uh, no. He has the map. He's got, he had the oh. original map. Oh, that's and, right. I, I and his, read something about And that. his mother thought it was trash when she cleaned up his room one day, oh. wadded it up, and threw it away. <laughs> Sounds like a very mother thing to do. Doesn't it? Um, so, these oh, are some mom's of our fired. Best well, see, it's Patty Jackson, so you kind of got to give her a pass. These are some of our best and our worst movies uh, for the 4th of July. Uh, blockbusters that we have loved and stuff that, well, we will never watch again. We'll be infamous for how horrible they really are. Um, and we will be doing a article in a, another show talking about the summer blockbusters that lit our fuse that really are the best and what defines why we love going to the movies during the summer uh, to begin with. So, but that is at a later date. So we're going to get on out of here uh, this week. Uh, listen to the electric jellyfish podcast, uh, electric sure. jellyfish podcast.com. And uh, also again, uh, if you're into gaming, Come join the Ultimate Gaming League and get into tournaments. We'll be there on the second and the uh, uh, fourth Wednesday of every month down at Craft and Growler. Come try uh, some of Brendan's uh, great, fantastic beers. And you got some more IPAs coming out, don't you, Brent? Well, I got one more IPA. I got a, I put a new APA on tap the other day, um, and then I've got a hazy IPA coming out. I'm trying to talk my boss. My boss wants more and more IPAs, and I'm like, look, I know there's 60% of the craft beer market, but let's leave – Let's leave some tap handles for the, the rest of the world to drink too. So and as much as I love IPAs, it's like I like some variety on my on my my board. I, I, I hate going to a brewery and seeing 10 IPAs in a Pilsner. It's like, come on. So I've uh, other than that, I've got a, a half of ice and I've got a cherry uh, in the tank. Monday, I'm brewing a, a cherry lemonade preliminary ice. Um, after that, I'm doing a table saison. After that, I'm doing a golden stout. Um after that, I'm doing an ode to Shinerbach called Black Eyebach, uh, and so I've got I've got a bunch more. So I'm trying to I'm trying to keep it uh, uh, something for everybody. I got a Pilsner I have to do after that. So um, well, and then so my point is, you might as well come game in some fantastic tournaments with prizes and good craft beer. And and, best and our and our house beers are two dollars off the night of the gaming tournament. So right. You know, you, so, can, you can have good beer and not get, you know, and not spend too much money. So and the food prices are very reasonable. So, I mean, there's there's a lot, you know, that you can do. So uh, just come on out. Enjoy it. You know, like I said, uh, we'll be back this Wednesday if you're having to watch this and you're in the Dallas area. So uh, but until then, until next week, uh, we're out. And everybody, it is time to say goodbye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.